An obsessive aunt skirting child labor law regulations and a pilot that's tough to revisit. Underneath all that family fun are some questionable things we ignore in Bob's Burgers. Throughout the run of Bob's Burgers, there are constant mentions of and examples pointing to one indisputable fact. The Belchers are very poor. Whenever Mr. Fish Odor stops by for whatever reason, there is always a mention of Bob and Linda being laid on rent. And if there was any doubt about this fact, the characters, even Bob and Linda's kids, say it all the time. But after watching the show for years, you start to wonder how this family has any money at all. Most episodes show that the status quo for the restaurant is vacancy, especially compared to the more successful Jimmy Pestles across the street. Surely the lack of patrons outside of Teddy and one or two stray customers an episode is concerning. There is the occasional boom, like the fan-animated Brunch Squatch episode, but a rare busy night is surely not enough to feed a family. The fact that the kids stay in the same grade and never age means that none of these questions really matter, but adult viewers still have to suspend their disbelief just a little bit. Some of the best parts of Bob's Burgers are the little details and recurring gags. For example, fans familiar with the show know to look out for the storefront next to the restaurant and the moving van that appears in each opening credit sequence. Another consistently funny bit is the burger of the day, which always changes and is always a pun. Whether it's the Texas Chainsaw Massacred Burger or the Graders of the Sauce Harvardi Burger, there is one thing that never changes on the board, the price. For over a dozen seasons now, the burger of the day has remained $5.95. Regardless of the ingredients or the absurd amount of work Bob must put into coming up with a new idea and product each day, it remains the same price. The rest of the menu has stayed the same too. From season 1 to season 12, burgers remain $5, while fries and soft drinks will run you $2 each. These prices were a bargain in 2011 and are even more unbelievable today. For those with particularly keen eyes, you might also notice the Belchers still have beer on the menu for $4, despite the restaurant almost never selling any. The Belchers are unable to hire any additional employees thanks to their dismal financial situation. So instead, all three of Bob and Linda's children are put to work. Maybe Bob wants to keep it a family business, but more often than not, it seems the kids cause more harm than good in the restaurant. The show normalizes the kids working so much, it's easy to forget that you don't see children working every day. Technically, minors in the United States are legally allowed to work in a business owned by their parents as long as they aren't missing school. By this standard, the Belcher kids putting in a few hours of work each night after school isn't illegal. Ugh, school again. Punching in for another day of unpaid child labor before we go home and do more unpaid child labor. However, safety is another concern. There are laws and precautions that apply specifically to restaurants employing children that say they cannot operate or be near dangerous equipment like a fryer or grill. Basically, every time we see the Belchers have a family meeting in the kitchen while Bob cooks up burgers and fries, that is probably breaking some kind of child safety law. Which is to say nothing of all the restaurant hijinks the kids get up to behind Bob and Linda's back. This has been an ongoing issue since the show's start that has never really been addressed. And at this point, it's such a renowned characteristic of the show, it will probably never change. Two of the three women in the lead voice cast of Bob Burgers are voiced by men. Linda is voiced by John Roberts and Tina by Dan Mint. Louise, voiced by Kristen Shaw, is the only member of the family voiced by a woman. I had a very interesting encounter with Mr. Fran today. He did? Yeah, he's an interesting guy. Yeah, he is very interesting, Tina. Although this isn't a deal breaker by any means, it could be a frustrating aspect to female fans of the show. Even more frustrating is the fact that according to Uprox, as recently as 2020, creator Lauren Bouchard doesn't seem to see an issue with the casting. It isn't too taboo to cast a voice actor who doesn't match the character's gender, especially on children's shows, but it is extremely prevalent in Bob's Burgers. In addition to voicing Bob, H. John Benjamin will often voice minor characters in episodes, including a major recurring female character, Louise's teacher, Miss LeBond. While many of these characters have achieved icon status, their acting is just a little questionable. It might be time to start thinking about Gail's obsession with her sister's husband. It's no secret that Gail has the hots for Bob. This awkward pairing has led to some of the series' best episodes. But seriously, Gail's burning passion for Bob is getting a bit creepy, don't you think? You ruined my Thanksgiving dinner because you wanted attention? No, I ruined your Thanksgiving dinner because I wanted attention! Oh wait, is that what you said? Gail is Linda's awkward, single, cat-loving sister, and she has a bit of a crush on Bob. It's an awkward situation that would definitely need some serious working out in real life. 
Thankfully, Bob's Burgers is a cartoon, so Gail can still be sympathetic and not some kind of home-wrecking monster. Plus, Bob isn't the only man in her life. At a certain point in the show, Gail and Wagstaff counselor Mr. Frond date. In the season 5 episode, Father of the Bob, we get our first big glimpse into Bob's childhood home life. He never had the greatest relationship with his father, Big Bob, especially after a traumatic burger-related event when Bob was a boy. The two reconnect in the episode and reach a resolution, but there is a huge missing link that is only briefly explained. Who is Bob's mother and where is she? In the episode, there is a line that implies Bob's mother died when he was a young child, and this is part of the reason his relationship with his father became so strained. She is only mentioned one other time, in a later episode. Bob recalls that he used to build gingerbread houses with his mom before she passed. Throughout the show, Tina yearns for the love of Jimmy Jr. and his backside. This pushes her to try and be included in his friend group of popular teens, despite the fact that they constantly berate and bully her. Still, they manage to get up to plenty of hijinks together, and over the course of the show, Tina's relationship with her bullies changes into something more resembling friendship. Tammy and Jocelyn are the meanest to Tina, as evidence in an episode like Broadcast Wagstaff School News, where Tina is excluded from the school news while Tammy succeeds as anchor. In episodes like this, Tina is the odd one out of the group, and even Zeke and Jimmy Jr. aren't her friends. However, in more recent episodes, Tina is treated almost like one of the group. Judging by the fact that no one ages in the show, viewers can assume time does not progress linearly in Bob's Burgers. Regardless of this fact, it seems that as we watch the show, Tina seems to be forming actual bonds with her peers and does indeed consider them friends. The season 2 episode, Burger Boss, features Bob at his most obsessive. When he recovers an old arcade game he used to be a master at, Bob starts spending every waking moment trying to top the machine's high score. He plays until he develops carpal tunnel syndrome and is prescribed painkillers for his wrist. The weird part comes when Linda sends the machine to a local arcade. First, Bob tries to enter the arcade without his children, but is told he needs to bring them. So Bob brings the kids along and immediately starts ignoring them in favor of the Burger Boss machine. That's bad parenting strike number one. His second mistake is to team up with another kid named Daryl, who gives Bob tips on how to play the game with one in particular raising some eyebrows. Why are you standing way back? You gotta press your wiener against the game like this. See? Yeah. Okay, all right. Wow. Oh, yeah. Wow. Eventually, Daryl offers to help in exchange for Bob beating up the bullies that terrorize him. This leads to an extremely awkward scene where Bob, high on painkillers, attempts to beat up the bullies and fortunately for all, fails. Bob's Burgers gives the impression that Calvin Fishodor is the richest man alive, at least compared to every other character we meet in the still unnamed town the cartoon is set in. Fishodor is a property owner, a narcissist, and probably a billionaire. While we don't have a list of everything he owns, his attitude points to the conclusion that Fishodor is more or less the most powerful man in town. What? That's horrible! If you don't like it, take it up with Mr. Fishodor. He owns the cops. For starters, he is the Belcher's landlord, implying he owns many retail and housing units. We know he owns the Wonder Wharf amusement park and baseball teams, and we know that his mansion is immense. What we don't know is how Fishodor is legally allowed to own so much property in such a seemingly small community. He is definitely breaking some anti-competition laws here, and Bob's Burgers isn't afraid to make Fishodor a villain and put him up to some scummy stuff. Even so, the worst of the tycoon's dealings likely happens behind the scenes. The first season of Bob's Burgers contains a series of the show's most offensive and inappropriate jokes. For example, the show's pilot, notably titled Human Flesh, includes a series of jokes and plot points that make the possibility that the Belchers are cannibals seem relatively tame. It all starts when health inspectors Hugo and Ron come to inspect the restaurant, and Louise decides to have some fun with the burger of the day. The burger of the day is the child molester. It comes with candy. <laughs> Get it? Yes. No. Later in the episode, a customer Bob says looks like a child molester winds up ordering a burger. Bob then tells Gene to serve him his food, making the fat phobic comment that since Gene is heavy, he's less in danger of being harmed by the creepy customer. In the same scene, Gene tries to volunteer Tina to run the food since she's the oldest. However, Bob insists Gene do it because Tina isn't great with customers, prompting the kids to protest. I'm good with the customers. Mm, yeah. Not really. I'm great with the customers. Mm. She's autistic. She can't help it. Yeah, I'm autistic. Bob. Just a sec. No, you're not autistic, Tina. To drive the controversial point home, the rest of the scene shows Gene throwing toothpicks on the floor for Tina to count in a parody of the film Rain Man, which is about an autistic savant. 
the first season of Bob's Burgers is definitely the most raunchy. In finding an identity that would keep it on Fox for over a decade, the show wasn't always quite as family-friendly as it is now. In particular, the episode Sheesh Cab Bob contains a plotline that reinforces negative stereotypes about trans people. In this episode, Bob becomes a cab driver to make some extra cash and ends up picking up a group of trans sex workers. Throughout the episode, there's some questionable stereotyping about both sex workers and trans people, and jokes that get a laugh out of misgendering these characters. So much so that the line between whether the show is saying the characters are cross-dressers or actually trans is blurred. 